So I'm pressing record now. It's going live. Okay. Yeah. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Reese Daniel. Reese, are you ready to be great today? I am. Let's do it. Reese Daniel is a co founder and CTO of Psalm EV, an electrical, an, an electric micro mobility company on a mission to bring EVs to the people. Prior to founding Psalm EV, we spent 12 years as a battery research engineer working in some of the most renowned battery labs in academia and industry. Through Psalm EV's battery subscription service, Reese has leveraged his battery testing experience to provide customers with a complete warrior-free battery experience. In addition to Psalm EV, Reese also works with battery and battery technology companies to help them improve the testing and development capabilities through his consulting practice, Daniel Consulting Group, LLC. He's a former helicopter mechanic, door gunner in the United States Marine Corps, where he did two tours in Iraq and cut his teeth as a grade A wrench turner. Reese holds a BA, BS in physics from, George, from the George Institute of Technology. Reese, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So before we get started, I have to ask a question. How does one go from being a helicopter mechanic to degree in physics? Because I, I can see the, the glide path, but I'm pretty sure you know, it's not an everyday turn of events for most helicopter mechanics, I would think. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, that's a great question. It, it's a, it's a, a one I get a lot too. Um, so um, yeah, so I guess uh, when I got out, I mean, the Marine Corps had really great training uh, on helicopters. You know, it, it's really, in my opinion, it's the best place in the world to get trained as a mechanic. Um, and I knew that I wanted to go to school when I got out of the Marines, I wanted to do something that was completely out of my wheelhouse, completely out of my comfort zone. I wanted to really challenge myself because uh, you know I had this GI Bill I was able to use to fund it. So I was like, let me do something that's really that's really great. Um, and physics just seemed like the most the farthest thing from <laughs> from anything. So, that so any were you like were you pretty good at math in high school? Like, did you take calculus and trigonometry in high school? No, I I, I was a completely I think my GPA in high school was like exactly in the middle, like right in the middle of everything. I, I did not really take the advanced placement classes. I was not an overachiever, <laughs> but five years in the Marine Corps, you know, you get a little bit of discipline uh, and you kind of get prioritized what's important. And, you know, I think I, I kind of put me in the shape of it, I guess. So, um, how does it like how did the adjustment happen for you like the transition from Marine Corps to going back to college? Was it a hard transition, easy transition? Um, you know, it was different. Uh it was it was it was definitely, you know, I was usually the oldest person in the class and or one of the oldest. Um and you know, there was a there was a sense of kind of feeling like you missed out on some of the real college life of, you know, like living in the dorms and stuff and the kind of all that stuff you you hear about and all your friends were doing while you were in Iraq, you know, digging fire pits. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I, I definitely, I would not have handled college nearly as well if I'd gone straight out of high school. I, I don't think I would have lasted. So uh, it's something that I personally needed to do. And I, I needed to kind of get this out of my system and kind of go out and see the world and, and, uh, and do a couple of interesting things before I, I came back and was able to focus on studying. Even with the world is Iraq, huh? Yeah, exactly. Even that part of the world. Yeah. So what exactly is a battery research engineer? Yeah. I, you know, that's another, another pretty common question too. Uh, it's, I would say the way I would define it is uh, someone who uh, really is, is, I guess, testing batteries and trying to find ways to make batteries better. Um, and, and really find out what batteries can and cannot do on the limits are, cause it's still, it's still a kind of a new technology. When I say batteries, I'm really almost exclusively talking about lithium ion batteries. That's really the, 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 the main name in the game right now. Um, and yeah, it, it's, I do a lot of battery testing. Um, you know, like for example, there's, uh, you know, customers that are, I have that are battery, actually battery people who are making new batteries and they want help figuring out, you know, how to test them to prove what they say or they hope it does. And, and they have other customers who just, you know, use batteries uh, extensively and in their product. And so they, they want to know that, 
they can they can claim certain specifications about the product um, to their customers and they can do it with confidence reliably and so a battery a lot of times is a really the bottleneck to that so seeing what the battery can and can't do and that kind of stuff so reese are different batteries made of different materials or like a better like a uh, each battery is pretty much made of the same material uh you know it, there's surprisingly few options when it comes to lithium batteries uh there's you know you see a lot of stuff come up every now and then like on, on reddit or or you know it's like uh different news articles will come out and say whatever battery breakthrough breakthrough um but really most the sad truth is most of that ends up kind of fizzling out and not quite making it to industry uh there's really only about three really three different chemistries that are kind of really commercially used today for lithium batteries so Reese, why do bad batteries like degrade? I know it's the same time you always hear about, you know, the iPhone batteries degrading after one or two years and different batteries degrading and, and like having like lower performance. Why, why is that? Man, uh, so the, the kind of, it's, it's a, a really involved question to answer. And it's, it's something that people are still actively trying to figure out. But the kind of short, all, uh, short catch all phrase is uh, parasitic reactions. That's really the thing that ultimately is going to end up making your battery perform more poorly over time and parasitic reactions is just kind of a like i said it's kind of a blanket term for things happening in the battery that you don't intend to happen um, you know when you have little ions that are that are charged moving around back and forth a lot sometimes they don't go the places you want them to go sometimes they go to other places and they stay there and you never see you never use them again um, and ultimately that kind of happens more and more and more over time uh, the one thing I will add to that, though, is you know, really batteries, as much as uh, there's a lot you can do to make a battery die sooner, to, 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 to degrade performance much sooner than it should, but there's really not a lot you can do to make it last longer. Um, batteries in general, as kind of a rule of thumb, is they fade as a function of time spent fully charged. That's the way to think of it. So the less time you can keep your battery in a fully charged state when it's not being used, the better it is for the battery. Okay. So no, so you're saying don't keep it hundred percent all the time. Exactly. Yeah. So like the, for example, and, and I, I'm guilty of this too, but you know, the, I think a lot of people's kind of instinct is to, you know, go home and they go to bed and they'll plug in their phone and just leave it plugged in until they wake up, wake up in the morning. I mean, your phone's gonna be done charging in two, three hours, and then that's another five hours or so that it's just sitting at fully charged, and you know the clock's ticking. Yeah, that's, um, that's but, definitely me. I use my phone yeah. as, as an alarm, so I to keep it plugged in. I, I mean, I'm a battery engineer. I do the same thing. <laughs> so you wrote an article on LinkedIn maybe two or three months ago about how all electrical vehicles are not cars. Can you talk about yeah. talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think so. You know, our company is uh, some EV and it's short for the Somerville electric vehicle company. Um, but we don't sell cars at all. We don't, we don't touch cars. Um, and we think that there are, uh, there's several commuting options and transportation options that don't have four wheels and, you know, aren't Tesla's. Um, if you want to go electric, um, there's a lot of things you can do with, um, for example, electric mopeds, electric scooters, um, even, I mean, there's, there's dozens of options these days, electric skateboards, electric unicycles, even uh, low speed vehicles. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the things I want to keep in mind. And I think there's a tendency for people to think of these things as toys, uh, when really they could, they could be a real replacement for a lot of things that people use their automobile for and their car for. How far can I remember you did our other article about how to use Google and other things to go get around and more like you know put on like put Google Maps, avoid highways. Mm -hmm. how, how like how realistic how far can you go on a moped? Like can you go like two, like 25, 30 miles or? Yeah, um, so it, it obviously depends like vastly moped to moped manufacturer to manufacturer. But uh, just as an example, our moped, our electric moped that we offer. Uh, on one battery, it can go 34 miles fully charged. Um, and then it has a capacity to hold up to two batteries. So in theory, you could do uh, 68, I'm doing math right, yeah, 68 miles uh, in a charge. 
So more more local commute stands, like same town then. Yeah, yeah. And it's I used to and and just to give you a frame of reference, I with my electric moped, uh, I used to, to commute to my old job, which was about eleven miles away every day. I, I would drove over there and sometimes I just take the batteries out and plug them in next to my desk and then pop in the end of the day and drive home. So talk about the concept of I believe so micro mobility. Yeah. Uh, so micro mobility is is a, uh, a bit of a, a, a you know broad phrase that is really anything that's not a car that's like a car and balloon. That's kind of the way to think about it. Um, and that's I don't know if we would if you would technically include motorcycles in that, but I would anything pretty much shy of a motorcycle. So. Uh, mopeds, scooters, uh, bicycles, um, uh, like I said, unicycles, skateboards. Uh, I think even rollerblades maybe counts micro mobility. I don't know. I don't know. No, no one's no one's really said that to me explicitly yet, but I would I would count it. So we're, we're going to talk about this in more detail in a minute. But you have two products: uh, a moped and a an extra scooter. Do mm -hmm. people have to get like driver's licenses or insurance or, or what kind of rules do all those for those? Yeah, uh, so that it so the the uh, statutes on what you do and don't need and, and where you can drive, how you can drive these different vehicles, uh, it varies state to state. But I would say in general, um, they're not too different from what we have here in Massachusetts. Uh, and in Massachusetts, um, you all you need to operate a, a moped is a you don't even need a full driver's license. You just need like a learner's permit. Um, so really, so you don't need a special light. You don't need a motorcycle's license. Uh, you don't need insurance. Um, and then same thing with a scooter. A scooter, I, a scooter, you don't even need, I don't think you need anything for a scooter as far as you know. Not, not even insurance? I know. Yeah, because when I think of a moped, I think, you know, something safe, you know, something maybe an older person might drive, you know, or like someone like a windbreaker or like a helmet. When I think of a scooter, I think of a teenager, you're like, you know, just going over everywhere, right? They've been kind of not reckless, but only like taking a lot of risks, you know? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And that's, I think that uh, this whole movement with shared mobility, uh, and that's another thing I, I actually, I want to point out too, is I, the, the phrases shared mobility and micro mobility get lumped together a lot, uh, but really two different things. Uh, by shared mobility, it almost always involves micro mobility vehicles. Like, uh, I don't know if you guys have like Bird or Lime or any of those guys. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we have Lime up here. Yeah. So, um, so that's shared mobility, and it's really shared micro mobility. Um, but that whole movement, that, which is which came up, you know, really like two years ago or so, three years ago, uh, not even three, probably two. Um, that's it's kind of a double-edged sword because in one sense, it's great that a lot of people are getting out there and trying these vehicles and, and finding an alternative to their internal combustion engine vehicle or their car. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of problems with it. Um, just to name a few, I mean, like you said, it, it's when anyone can access it, you know, the problem is anyone can access it. <laughs> so you have people driving all over the place, you know, without really proper training or proper consideration. Um, and also I think, you know, there, there's other issues with that, like, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it tends to be an issue or it's a problem, like having them on the sidewalk and stuff. It kind of yeah, blocks. Yeah, that's a big problem. So like, you see how like, you'll see them like everywhere on the sidewalk. People just get off and foam in the middle of the sidewalk. It's just like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I don't, I don't blame them, honestly. It, it's, I, I, you know, I personally am not a big fan of shared mobility. Um, I think, and that's why at some EV, we kind of, we really push ownership. Like we want this to be your vehicle that you own. And then you you ride it um, because you know that's just it, it's I don't think it's a sustain, sustainable way to do it is to have si uh, scooters laying on the sidewalk everywhere. So I've heard this pretty... concept called the last mile. Is this what you're trying to solve? This last mile challenge that people say we have. So the 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 last mile, the first and last mile thing. Um, so that so our vehicles could definitely be applicable to that. Applicable to that. Some of them. Uh, like the scooter uh, could be, um, and maybe even our e-bike, but that's really more so for the shared mobility because the concept of that is like, you know, if you take, um, 
for example, if you take like the a train in the town and the work, and your work is a mile, let's say a mile from the train station, then it's that kind of getting from there from that point to that point, that last mile. And I guess the spirit of the shared mobility movement is that they have uh, you know, they would have like a dock or like a, a handful of scooters there for someone to just pick up and take. And then when they get to work, they can just leave it there. That's the idea of that. Okay. And then um, let's talk about your SOM EV moped. Mm -hmm. So first, like, how do you manufacture it? Mm. So we have a partner we work with in China, which you know, my, like almost everything else is manufactured. So it's, it's, it's mostly coming from China. Uh, and then when it gets here, we have a few, well, we have a few specifications um, that we make with the manufacturer over there that make it our specific own moped. Uh, and then when it gets here, we have a few additional things we have to do to it to make it uh, compliant for use on roads in the US. Um, and that means it has to be compliant to uh, the, I mean, it's a, it's a really boring thing to read, but we, we know it quite well. It's the FMVSS uh, Title 49. Um, and it's all these regulations of stuff you have to have you know, it's it like lights, brakes, all this, all this stuff. It has to be a certain way and test a certain way. Uh, and so there, there's stuff we do when it gets here that um, to make it compliant for for using on, on roads in the U.S. And are people able to custom order or is this pretty much, they, they just like one style to get right now? Uh, what was that? I'm sorry. Are, are, are people able to custom order like diff, different colors, different things, or is this pretty much one style right now? So we have, right now we have one style. We have a, a a 48 volt uh, moped, the, the S, uh, I'm sorry, the N1 model. Um, but very soon in the future, we're going to have uh, our uh, 60 volt version, which actually goes up to 30 miles an hour. This, the 48 volt goes up to 25 miles an hour. Um, and we have four different colors to choose from right now. Um, currently, we're doing pre orders. Uh, we are going to have a few uh, in inventory pretty soon, I think within the next month and a half. Um, but for right now, we're mainly doing pre-orders. So if we do a pre-order, then we can uh, we can certainly do a uh, color of your choosing. And so I'm guessing people order online and the mope is delivered to their house. Do they have to come somewhere else to pick it up? How does that work? So right now we are like super local. Um, and so we're, we're really just, it's a pickup thing uh, in the local kind of greater Boston area, New England area. Um, we would like to get to a place where we're shipping soon. Um, but for right now, it's just, we, we gotta start somewhere. And, and this is kind of, the, the, all things is there, this is the most rational option for us. And I guess it's the same same method with the, the uh, electrical scooter too, pretty much? Yeah, that's correct. And what, what are you having the most success, success with right now, the mopeds or the, or the scooters? You know, uh, to our surprise, the scooter. Um, we, 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 cause we personally, like I, I one of the motivations for this company was when I bought an electric moped a couple of years ago and kind of like refurbished it and, and everything, and, uh, you know, put swappable lithium batteries in it. And, um, and I love it. And I end up like using it for 90% of the stuff I use my car for. And that was the motivation. I was like, oh, we're going to do mopeds. It's great. We'll add scooters as like an extra thing, but really the scooters have, have really been uh, the hot ticket item. That's the thing that people, seem to really like and my impression is that that generally is is there's kind of a level of comfort and familiarity with that with a scooter and and um and security um because you know a lot of people have probably already tried out some shared mobility options like bourbon lime um the scooter goes a bit slower uh it tops out at 15 miles an hour also you're you know pretty low to the ground you can just jump off any second if it if you don't feel safe so I so the scooter is, is has been the big ticket item, but uh, we still really believe in the mopeds, and we're still kind of we're still pushing that. And, and for the people that do that are into the mopeds, are like really into the mopeds. So how does it work for mopeds and scooters? For like you know like uh, of course I'm still be on like high, on the roads and streets, but about bike lanes, sidewalks, and those kind of things. Yes, yeah, so that, that's again that you know that, that varies uh, pretty. Uh, I won't I won't say wildly, but it, it it does vary from state to state, and that's really a state thing. But 
just to give an example of Massachusetts, which <clears throat> I think is, is, is not that different from most states. Um, so Massachusetts, they have different classifications of, and let's, let's just start with moped. Uh, so you have a moped and then you have a limited use motorcycle and you have a motorcycle. And a moped has to be, uh, has to go 30 miles an hour or lower. Um, and this is interesting for electric mopeds, uh, the classification is that it has to have an engine size of 50 cc's or smaller. Obviously, we're zero cc's, so that's just kind of throw out the window. Um, so really, and, and in Massachusetts, uh, mopeds can go, can travel the bike lane and they can travel on the main roads. Um, they cannot travel on uh, recreational bike paths. So you can't go with these, you know, these paths that are meant just for like going through the woods and stuff. You can't do that. Um, but really it, it's, that's really one of the, one of the, the very nice things about commuting around a, a city in a moped is that the fact that you can go back and forth between the bike lane and the main lane, the main road, uh, it effectively gives you kind of front of the line privileges at every red light. Uh, and so that's, that's a very, very nice thing. It's like traffic is just, just kind of becomes a thing of the past a bit, especially if you have a city with a nice bike lane infrastructure, uh, which fortunately we do here in the Somerville, Boston area. Uh, and then scooters, uh, scooters are, I believe you can go to the bike lane on scooters. You, yeah, you can in Massachusetts and you can also ride them on the sidewalk. And I think the maximum speed on scooters for it to be called a scooter is, I want to say 20 miles, it's like 18 or 20 miles an hour, somewhere in that neighborhood. Is there anything out there showing, like stats showing, like how often people in scooters or mopeds get pulled over by the police for like various traffic things or whatever mm -hmm. reason? You like know, more, more higher or lower than like a regular car. You know, I, I'm, I would, my, and this is just my feelings. I, I don't know. That, I'm sure there's some stats out there somewhere. Uh, I don't know them, but my feelings tell me that it's a bit lower. Um, and I say that because I'll, I'll just give you, you know, anecdotally a story. Um, so the, I was actually talking to someone the, the other day that pulled up to our, we have a, a pop-up here in Somerville we do on the weekends um, to let people test drive with vehicles. And um, someone pulled up on a gasoline moped and I was talking to them a bit. And, uh, and they were saying that how, how like it's, they, they live over in this area called Jamaica Plain in Boston. Um, and they just, uh, it's, it's kind of a free for all there a bit. Like they, like people, they don't even wear, like you could ride around a moped without wearing a helmet and, and the police you aren't going to give you any issue or trouble over there. I mean, I don't recommend that definitely. Uh, but that's just the anecdote to kind of show, give you an idea of like, uh, you know, how little, and also I think that, I think that, you know, to be honest with you, if you're in a, a city with, with any sort of like crime rate or anything like it, it's not mopeds aren't their biggest concern aren't police officers biggest concern uh and and a lot of times i think they, may, they might even know what the rules are if i had to guess but that, again this is just me just kind of my feelings <laughs> so speaking of crime just a random question like i always wonder the like, of mopeds and motorcycles what keep what, what keeps people from stealing them right like mm. <laughs> not I enough mean, i realize you can't like start them up but i mean what's keeping them somebody's like pick two people picking them up from the back of the truck and leave them. But I mean, you don't hear like most, like a lot of like motorcycle moped theft, right? Like that anyway, at least I don't. Oh, like wow. Well, I, I, I would, I would say, uh, you do actually. I, 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 uh, that is a pretty common problem. Um, it, it is, uh, people do walk off of them. Um, and you know, there's a few, a few things you can do to keep it safe, uh, or, or to keep it from being stolen. But actually I, I just talked to someone the other, just two days ago, uh, who they left their moped outside, they took the keys out and everything, and they, they said they went inside for like an hour and came out and someone had taken it. Um, and then well, I know one of the one of the people that work in the same co-working space that I work at too that said they get, they get a new moped like every two years because someone steals it. Um, but I know I do. Yeah, I know it, it's it's really it's really a big it's it's a big issue. Um, because yeah, they are a little bit too easy to take because they're so small and light. Uh, however, I will say that um, the uh, there's a couple things you can do. 
to prevent that. So first of all, a lot of mopeds, um, and our, ours does this too, they, they have a feature mm -hmm. where you have a, a wheel lock, um, and so it'll lock the wheel. And so if anyone steals it, they kind of have to go in circles. <laughs> you know, they can't drive in a straight line. Um, and that's like a mechanical thing. So it's not just, uh, you know, shorten some wires to fix it. Uh, and then um, another thing, our moped actually comes, the Summit View moped comes with a built-in alarm system. Uh, and so if you budget it all, it just starts making a bunch of noise and annoying people. Um, and also it's, it's just always, always a good idea to have some sort of wheel lock. Um, like I, my other moped, I have a, a disc brake lock on there. Uh, and so you can't really move it very far. And um, I see people use the big chain locks that wrap through the, the rim. Um, so it's a few options. I mean, it, but it still happens. I mean, unfortunately, you know, cars are too heavy. Are, are heavier, so they're harder to steal. But so for your production meeting on China, is it the same production factory doing both the moped and the scooter, or you have different production facilities? We have different. We have, so we have. So right now we have uh, the only the only vehicles we have listed for sale right now are the moped and the scooter, uh, but we also have an e-bike and an electric cargo bike um, that that'll be on there. It'll be available soon, um, but uh it is yeah it's just a different manufacturers for all four and what's like your your current production capacity right now so we could do um i mean what we, we haven't hit a limit yet but i'd say we can do uh over 50 a month you know without without much difficulty and how often do y'all go over to China? I don't know, go check it out or inspect it, whatever the case may be. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, you know, it, it's any travel yeah, to China now, yeah. <laughs> closed off recently. Yeah. But um, uh, but we but we are very lucky in the sense that we have a uh, we actually have a, a, a foreign operations manager that lives in China that's over there, uh, and so so he ends up being kind of our eyes on the ground over there, and he'll go in and actually like follow up with, with people for us or, uh, you know, check shipments before they head over here. So we, we've done the best we can uh, without being able to go over there right now. So Reese, you, know, you always said everything's made in China, right? But how does that process work? I mean, I'm sure you just don't decide, I'm gonna make something in China and, and, and randomly, you know, build something, right? How's that process work? You, you go visit China, like you, you had the, the, the operation officer helping you out. How does that process work? How do you pick the factory, like the whole thing? Yeah. Uh, so I would say the first part of the process was um, really finding finding some models that are the vehicle mod makes some models that uh, meet all the requirements we want um, style requirements uh, functionality requirements voltage requirements performance requirements um, and so that was that was a that was a pretty involved thing even just just finding uh, make some models that we wanted that were that were close to it. Uh, and so then from there, we, we had a handful of manufacturers that we, that we knew did good work and that we, that, you know, made the products that we, that met our specifications and we talked to them, uh, and we're like, oh, you know, if you start, you know, if you take this model, uh, and modify it this way, you know, how much is that going to cost? What's that, what's that going to mean for the lead time? Uh, what's it, how's it going to affect performance? Uh, and so we kind of start with that. So I, I guess. The shorter answer to your question would be, you know, we basically find something that's as close to what we want or what we're looking for as possible, and then work in the manufacturer to make modifications from there. And and really, and, and the, manufa the manufacturers that we ended up with uh, ended up being a combination of who was most willing to work with us, um, who had the highest quality products, who was the best to work with. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we're, we're, we're pretty happy now. We're in a pretty good place with our manufacturers and the vehicles they're getting for us. Reese, what percentage of sales do you have like, we'll say like rural communities or farming communities or, or quote unquote in the, in the country versus a city? You know, not, not many, honest, honestly. Uh, it's really, you know, in this, this, the model and the way it is now is really geared toward um, people that live or, or at least commute into or out of uh, uh, highly congested urban areas. So that's, that's really what it works for. 
So Reese, yeah. two part question. Part one, who's your targeted demographic? And part two, who's actually buying it? Mm. You're, 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 you're... <laughs> Great question. Uh, so target demographic, um, I would say it, it, like I said, it's, it's probably, it's going to be people who are, um, probably urban, uh, urban dwellers, uh, people who work in the city, live in the city, um, have a need to get around the city. Um, and I would say people who are actually buying it. It's, it's not that far off from that, honestly, it, it's, you know, as much as we, I guess the only extra thing to add to that is as much as we, you know, would really like to have this be something that's accessible to everyone and that everyone is interested in and adopts, um, you really, you, you do end up seeing uh, males as early adopters for a lot of this stuff. And we're still kind of in that, in that position where we're still getting a lot of, uh, I guess, like techie male, you know, dudes <laughs> you know, coming to ride around on scooters. Um, but, uh, yeah. So. Hey, Reese, if I'm, if I'm remember correctly, you and your, your wife co-founded the company, right? That's right. Yeah. And so y'all bootstrapping, are you, have you raised funds? Do you want to raise funds? What's that looking like? Uh, we are, we're bootstrapping and I don't know, we're, we're, we're open to talking to, to having conversations with people about funding. Um, but, you know, we really, uh, we kind of, we have a vision of how we want to do it. And it, it you know, we kind of went through a, about a, a good year uh, doing the kind of song and dance for like venture funding and stuff. And, and I feel like it, it would just, it, it, it all, it all kind of felt like a, a bit of a waste for us. And this is, you know, just for us, uh, there's a lot of companies that this works, that model works really well for, but, um, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, this is something that's very special to us, this company and, and we have a vision and we want, we wanted to keep that vision intact and we want to compromise it. Um, and so, yeah, we we're bootstrapping. Uh, and so fortunately the, uh, my, the consulting business, the battery consulting, uh, that did well enough, you know, when, when I, when I was doing that full time that I was able to set aside enough that we were able to kind of fund this and start this and get the ball rolling. So, so now we're kind of just self-funded and, and rolling along. Reese, so you can, can you talk about your company more detail, like how the idea got started, the journey, what's going mm -hmm. on with it right now and what is your vision for the company in the future? Sure. Uh, so the company, I, I'd say the very beginning origins of the company were uh, when I found a, a used, electric moped on Craigslist. Um, and it was a whole story of how I actually ended up getting it, but uh, I got it and it was originally, it was made with uh, four lead acid batteries. And I took those out and replaced them with a lithium ion battery pack um, that was removable. And I just started using that to go to work. And I was like, and I, I originally started even looking for that because I was like, you know, I, I, I'm so I'm, I'm I feel guilty now every time I like pump gas and like I use an internal combustion engine at this kind of like it's not good for the environment I don't want to do this but in the same sense you know we live in the third floor of a condo in Somerville and with street parking like I'm not where am I going to put a Tesla I mean I'm not I can't I'm gonna like throw an extension cord out the window you know I'm not there's, there's no option for for people that live in these areas um, and you know and we're both battery engineers so if anyone should have it electric vehicle you would think it'd be us um and so electric moped ended up being a good option uh and then and i just i started using that and i loved it so much i was like you know i this is just so convenient and so nice i bet more people would like this option i bet more people would like to, to have this as an option and you know when you search around there's really not there aren't really many options here in the u.s for electric mopeds i just they're just for some reason i haven't really penetrated over here yet and Reese, on your website, there's actually two ways to purchase your products, right? I think one is like a lease and another one's like a right, right, buy. Can you talk about those? Yeah, yeah. So the um, so we have a uh, we have one option where you can buy the vehicle completely outright. Uh, and so that would be like a traditional purchase where you you buy 
the moped and the battery goes in the moped and the charger and everything. And, and then we have another option. Uh, and again, this is, this is for the moped and for the bike, uh, not for the scooter yet, maybe in the future, but not yet, uh, where you can uh, buy the vehicle, but then subscribe or lease the battery. Um, and so the reason we do that is because if you do any sort of uh, uh, searches for like most common problems with e-bikes or e-mopeds, 100% of the time, battery's gonna be number one. Uh, it, it just, that, that's the thing that fails most often. Uh, that's the thing that fails first. Um, and so there's a lot of, I think, apprehension and anxiety around that, around battery ownership with people. And so we wanna leave some of that a bit. And so basically with a battery subscription model, uh, you would pay a much lower upfront cost for the vehicle. You'd own the vehicle, but you pay a monthly subscription for the battery. And so if there's ever, ever any issues with it, even if it's just, if it's just, you know, just does a weird thing once or a light comes on, you don't, aren't, don't like, you can just swap it out with us. No questions asked. Um, and so it's like a, like an extended warranty pretty much for a battery. And, and really, and for the future vision, this kind of touches on the, your last question a bit. For the future vision of this, um, we want to get to a place where we have these uh, public-facing kiosks, which are, you know, like a, you can think of them as, as like, a, uh, like a red box for batteries. You know, the red box, we get the DVDs, right? Uh, yeah. like, like, uh, so it'd be like that, um, like a vending machine for batteries where you pull up to it with a drain battery, drop off your drain battery and pick up a fresh one and keep going. Uh, and actually there's some, there's a company in, in Taiwan that, that has been doing this model for the past uh, over two years now that have been hugely successful uh, called GoGoRo. Uh, and so it's a model very similar to that. And that's, that's where we plan to ultimately go with this idea too. Uh, we want the bigger vision would be for people to own the vehicle, subscribe to the battery, and then just have a swap and go option with these public facing kiosks. So Reese, how is your idea of the battery swap out the kiosk better for an environment versus just like regular uh, electrical charging stations? So uh, there, are, there are a few ways. So it's first off, it's a matter of time um, because even, even with the best battery uh, and the best charging, I mean, you're still like, if you, even with fast charging, fast charging is still going to be like an hour, right? With like a Tesla or whatever, uh, which even then as a battery engineer, I'm very trepidatious about that. Uh, I, I, that's not good for the battery long-term. Um, so uh, with, if, with a swappable battery, uh, well, with public facing kiosk, you would have uh, an option to swap out your battery immediately for fresh ones who have to wait for the charge. Uh, but then also, there is this idea of um, like it's 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 better for the battery too, because uh, first off, you're not just trying to charge it really fast to like make up this time. Um, also, it which which is bad for the battery, and then also uh, it's if you have a collection of batteries like in a kiosk, you know, throughout a city, there's going to be a very high turnover rate uh, with the batteries, and so. You know, pretty much as soon as one's charged, it's picked up by the next person for use. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, the, the less amount of time you can spend fully charged, the better for the battery, the longer that the battery's going to last. Um, and so that's compared to the alternative, which would be people, you know, if they own a battery, you know, plug it in their scooter or whatever um, overnight, and then it just sits there for, you know, five, six hours fully charged, or maybe even a couple of days if they don't use it for the next couple of days. Uh, and that's, and then, like I said, the clock's ticking as long as it's charged there. So it's just degrading the battery. Reese, how from the future, or do, you, or do you see a time where we're gonna have more electrical cars versus our current gas guzzling cars? Mm. Oh man. Oh. Oh, is that too far from the future? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I hope it's soon. Uh, I, if I had to put a date on it, when there would be a transition, um, man, maybe, oh, it, it could be, it's, I'm optimistic. It, it could be as soon as 12 years, let's say. 12 years, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and tell me I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people they won't go electric because they you know they won't get rid of oil. But you just have to use oil to make electricity, right? You're not you really do. getting rid yeah. of the oil industry, are you? Just getting rid of all the all the bad effects of the gas cars, right? I mean, yeah. oil still made to make electricity, right? So, so the um, and that, and, that, and that's a that's a valid point. Um, so even if you're plugging in your battery to the wall, that electricity is coming probably from coal burning plant plants somewhere. Um, and so it's still not 100% clean, which, you know, that's a bummer. But uh, if you actually like sit down and look at the numbers and, and compare the efficiency, um, gasoline, so an electric vehicle, even all things considered, right? Let's, let's just take a Tesla, for example. Um, if you consider the full spectrum of where that energy comes from and where it goes to, um, you're looking even even with a, a you know coal burning plant charging of the vehicle, you're still looking at maybe about um, I would say forty. It's maybe like forty percent inefficient. If that's the way to put it, uh, at the most. And, and so it's so I guess you, another way to think of that is it's only sixty percent efficient. Uh, but if you look at gasoline, like right out of the pump, like just not, not even considering the efficiency of the car or anything else or whatever, right out of the pump to get the gasoline from where it was in the ground to the pump going into your car, uh, it's already only 45% efficient at that point. And so it, even it, it's still better. That's my point. That's a takeaway. It's still better. Even if you have coal burning power plants, uh, and you know, my opinion is, I feel like you you, you have to solve one problem at a time, and um, you know, we got to start. Well, right now we're starting with electric vehicles, and then, you know, maybe once we kind of get a good footing with that, then we can start getting rid of these uh, coal power plants, replace them with uh, solar plants or solar thermal or geothermal or wind, you know, uh, windmills. I don't know. Reese, what's something about electrical vehicles that the that the common person doesn't know or is, or, or is getting wrong? Hmm. Uh, I I think the biggest misconception about electric vehicles in general is uh, is around, probably around fast charging. Uh, I think I think fast charging is not the answer from a you know from purely from a battery point of view. Um, and it's not the solution. It's not going to be the thing that that saves us. It's not going to be the thing that makes electric vehicles happen. Um, and I say that because you know, as, as someone who's really spent you know the last 12, 12 plus years, really kind of at the forefront of battery research, um, it, it's lithium ion batteries. It, they're kind of the best in the game, and they're and it it's kind of all indication would tell us that it's going to be that way for the foreseeable future. And there's a fundamental chemistry, electrochemistry limit uh, that you're running into when you're trying to fast charge. And the battery just, it just can't do it. It can't do it well. It can't do it reproducibly. You can get away with it a few times, but you're going to pay a price in the long run. Um, and not to mention that, say, say tomorrow we get some sort of legislation or something, and then everyone, everyone suddenly can get a Tesla and everyone can get a fast charger, right? And solve their home. Well, I mean, uh, the, the energy requirement to charge a, a Tesla, a Tesla, let's say Model S fully, um, that's about the same energy budget as running a Walmart store for 45 minutes, just to give you perspective. And so if you imagine every single household using that equivalent of, of running a, an entire Walmart for 45 minutes the progress and then one to do that within an hour. It, I mean, the, the grid can't handle it. There's no way. I mean, you, you, we would need a completely new grid. Uh, it's just not feasible. And so I think I mean, the better option is, is trying to make swappable happen, trying to make removable batteries happen uh, because you really, that's just, I don't think fast charging is the answer. I guess that's, that's more my opinion than what people do or don't know about it, but so, Reese, for your products, how does the how does maintenance and servicing work? So we take care of that. We actually are um, we are myself and one other person in the company right now. We're uh, uh, 
actually certified light electric vehicle technicians, um, which most people probably don't know it's a thing, but it's a thing. <laughs> we, so we're actually certified to work on uh, and perform maintenance on uh, light electric vehicles, which is like another term for e-bikes and e-mopeds and e-skateboards, all that stuff. We just, we just replaced someone's, or we just fixed someone's uh, uh, electric unicycle today and we're going to someone else's electric scooter. So yeah, we take care of all that. So I'm guessing once you start scaling big time and you start getting a lot of orders, you're going to have to train up new people to do that for you. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, we are. And we, and, and we want to, we really want to keep um, a kind of public outreach component to this company. Um, and so one of our future plans is, is to, is to start becoming light electric vehicle technician trainers and start training people. And, and um, you know, even offering this as, you know, if not free, as cheaply as we can, just to kind of get more people educated and out there and increase like literacy around this kind of stuff. Reese, can you talk about how being a military veteran has helped, has helped you being an entrepreneur? Oh man. Uh, you know, I, I feel, I feel like, you know, when people, uh, when people ask me about how the military has helped me in various capacities, uh, the answer is usually some sort of variation of the same thing, which is, you know, and, uh, not to say whatever, but it, it really, uh, increases your threshold for the crap you can put up with. <laughs> you know, I don't know that's that not a good saying. answer. Yeah. Very good I answer. Mean, it really is. It's, it's like, I, and, and the thing is I tell people is like, even in my worst day at some EV or work, it's, I'd still rather be there than be a boot camp. You know, I'd still rather be there than be in Iraq. So I'm like, yeah, it's not too bad, you know? Yeah. I know a lot of people tell you, like, being an entrepreneur is hard. And I'll say, well, I won't disagree with that. I'll say it's not easy. It's, it's difficult. But is it really hard? Like, you know, we've done a lot of harder stuff in the military, right? Like, yes. Way definitely. harder. Like, harder decisions, harder situations. Like, I, I, I even told someone the other day, if you, being an entrepreneur is the hardest thing you've done in your life, you've had a blessed life. <laughs> yeah. Things, things are going great for you. Uh but yeah, no, I, it's, it's, that's, 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 that's my answer. And it's, uh, it's something every day, every day I, I wake up and I'm not, uh, in Paris Island. I'm like, oh, you know, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> <laughs> so when did the idea come into you first to be entrepreneurial? Were you getting your, your physics degree? Was it back in the Marines? When did, when did it first come to you? Like, I want to, I want to do this, this uh, micro mobility company. Um, you know, I've met, I, I feel, I've met, I've met people who have had uh, a goal or an ambition to be uh, an entrepreneur uh, for, you know, for a while. And uh, I don't, I'm not one of those people. I didn't, I don't really think that I, I didn't really think about being an entrepreneur for, for really up, up until about two years ago. Um, and really the only reason I, I, it was really the idea of the company and this idea of swapping batteries and and micro mobility in this kiosk uh it was really that idea that made me think oh this I, this is a good idea i think this is this is something cool i should start a company doing this uh and then lo and behold now i'm an entrepreneur um but yeah so i, I guess that's the answer is about it's, it's probably about two years ago before that you know i just wanted to be the best engineer in the world so Reese, during your, your entrepreneurial journey, talk about something that's happened that you weren't expecting, right? So it could have been something good that happened, something bad that happened, but something that you totally did not expect. Hmm. Um, let's see. What has happened? There's so many things that I didn't expect. Uh, um, I, I feel like, I feel like I, I didn't, I didn't think it would be so hard to communicate the vision of people. You know, I, the I, I have to, I have to challenge to. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, right. It's, it's how like can you, how can you not get it? It's so simple. Like, are you kidding me right now? Like, what do you, what do you, what? I can't, yeah. I, I can't, I can't dumb it down anymore. Yeah. You know, I, 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 that's, and that's the same thing with me. I, it's just, uh, you know, there, there's for me it, in my head, it's so straightforward. It makes sense. Like, this is clearly the answer. This is clearly the way to do it. And then, uh, and people just don't get it. And, they, and, and not only, it's one thing if people don't get it, 
you know, when they're like trying to get it or they're, or they're sympathized or they get, they don't get it. Uh, it's another thing for people that if they don't get it and they try to like convince you or somehow make you think that, well, no, you're, you're the wrong, you're, I, I'm right. So obviously it's is not a good uh, idea. I've and definitely been there, done that before. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. Uh, no, it, it, it's, um, yeah, people will waste a lot of your time um, with that kind of stuff. But I, I guess that's it, yeah, that, that my answer is, is, is. So that's a good how, segue. Talk about taking advice or better yet, not taking advice from people. <laughs> yeah, man, I could do a whole podcast on that. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you know, there, there's, that's, that's a tough one. You know, at the end of the day, uh, for me at least, it comes to, um, I, really, I really just have to stay true to my own best judgment. Um, I mean, I seek advice and I, and I try to, to, you know, to be humble and, um, and to be receptive as much as possible and not dismissive of minded. But um, there's a certain point that I've reached a few with a few conversations with a few people where I'm just like, okay, now this is just, this is just not good advice or this is not something I should listen to. Um, and it doesn't really mean that that person uh, just gives bad advice or is lacking in wisdom or something. It just, it just is just for whatever reason, they don't quite get the vision or they get the, the thing or they're not seeing it or they're seeing a different pathway. Um, and a lot, and a lot of times too, and this is just, I'm not going to change it here, but um, I, I feel like I hear, um, I hear a lot of people, you know, almost like regurgitating the same lines over and over again. Yeah, regardless of the situation, regardless of the back of the person, same advice, it's the same template advice, regardless. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like you could, you know, in certain scenarios, I feel like I could just, I could tell you, I could predict what that person's gonna, what advice they're gonna give me or why they're gonna say this isn't is gonna work, whatever. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just, you got to fall back on your own best judgment, I guess. Because at the end of the day, that's what the company is. It's you and your judgment. It's your company. So, Reese, as an entrepreneur, you're doing like, you know, sales, marketing, production line, safety stuff, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you approach each day? Like, do you have a calendar you focus on? Do you wing it? Like, how do you make <laughs> sure you're focused on the, on the priority you have focus on for that day? Um, yeah, so there's a few things. Well, first off, not to say that, we're doing it well, but <laughs> we're doing it. Uh, um, so I, I think, so there's a couple of tools that we've used um, and we, we still use. Um, so I, so first off, we have a, a meeting, a company-wide meeting every morning um, at 10 a.m. Um, and it's usually, well, it's nominally pretty quick. Um, it's like 15, 20 minutes and I think that's a really good idea because it's, you know, it kind of keeps you in contact with people and keeps you like, everyone's kind of, okay, this is, the, this is what we're working on. Here's the, here's the thing for the day. Here's the deal. Um, also we have a, um, a running kind of Google sheets, a very simple thing. That's like a task list and it's, you know, color coded by, you know, if it's in action or if it's, uh, like, you know, uh, complete or if it's a waiting action or it's delayed or whatever. Um, and that's kind of like, we keep track, everything that we have to do in the company is like on that list somewhere in a row uh, with our names and the dates of signing and any notes. Um, and so that we usually, when we have the meeting, we'll all have that document open in front of us. And so we'll kind of read off what we're working on, what we're delayed on, that kind of stuff. So that's pretty helpful. Um, and then uh, also we, we, I've really come around to Slack. Uh, I, I was I was a little bit um, a little bit cautious at first. I, I didn't I, I didn't really get it, uh, but I'm actually finding it to be quite a useful tool for us. Uh, so we have a Slack group in our company, and that's pretty helpful. Um, and then in addition to that, um, you know, just I, I guess delegating and trusting to hiring people you can trust, and uh, and delegating them with stuff. Because, you know, it, it's, it's the temptation of micromanage is always there. There's always something in the back of my head. that's like, well, 
you know, could I do that better? And, and it's just what, like, no, that's their thing. That's what they're working on. I would do my thing as what I'm working on and let it be. Reese, talk about the importance of taking care of yourself as an entrepreneur. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, for me, for me personally, um, you know, I've, I've kind of come to terms with recognizing when I reach a limit, uh, when I reach a limit for the day or for the week or whatever, uh, or on a project, um, you know, there's just a point and I, I don't even really know how to describe it, but there's a point where I'm, I'm working on, and I just, I know that it starts to feel like the stuff I'm doing is just almost going through the motions and not, and not actually like working toward a thing. Um, and I realize that, you know, I, I'm like, well, you know, I'm actually getting a little bit burnt out on this. I mean, a little bit, uh, brain fried right now. And I need to not do this as much as important as it is. And, and, and you know, there's a deadline coming up and whatever. I just, I have to recognize that I am not a machine and, in order for this human to function, this human has to have some sort of way, some sort of outlet that's not work. Um, and so, you know, I try to keep, I try to keep some pretty healthy hobbies. Um, like I, you know, I play guitar every now and then. Um, I, you know, like do some writing. I have a little, um, a science meetup group I, I host every week. Uh, so that's always nice. Um, I read. So, yeah, I just try, I, I, I try to like a lot time, you know, for me and for me expressing myself is, because that's something I, I, I don't want to underwhelm. I don't want to underestimate. And it's kind of thing that if I do, I feel like I'll just get better at work and better at my job and better at the company. And, and um, that's the last thing we need. So Reese, you kind of already answered this, but how do you do your schedule? Like, do you work 24, seven, seven days a week? You like, do you make yourself take weekends off? You like, you know, like I have one friend who'll like, he'll work 21 days straight, take three days off. Or do you like take one or two hours a day? Like, how do you, how do you work that? Or is this, you know, different each week? Um, it is, I'd say it's different. It's so far, it's, it's kind of different each week, but, um, right now I, well, for, for the summer, we've been hosting this pop-up. So we've been kind of working, uh, technically working seven days a week, but it's, uh, you know, not really been eight hour days per se. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of winging now. I, I, I usually like, I know, I, I know I'm not going to be very productive in the evenings, but I've been working all day. So, um, you know, I usually will kind of hit a, a, a limit around maybe like seven or eight or so. And I'm like, well, I got to go off and do my own stuff. And then, and then every, every Wednesday night I have, you know, I have off from 8 p.m. onward because that's, you know, when I have my, my meetup group and, um, yeah, so it's, it's yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess the short answer is not, it's not really a definite time now. I just, I just try to be mindful of it and try to, uh, you know, play by ear. So back to the mopeds, is there a minimum age to be able to be on a moped or electric scooter? Uh, it's state to state, but I think, I think in Massachusetts, I believe last time I checked, I believe it was 16 was the minimum age to, to operate a moped. Um, okay. and it's, it's different then. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so it's, it's, I mean, it's generally gonna be 16 to 18 and I, honestly, it might even have been 15 at one point, uh, in Massachusetts, but yeah, 16, to 18, usually. Um, scooter, I don't think there's any age limit. I don't think there's any age limit. I could be wrong. So you and your wife co-found the company. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the dynamic dynamics of that? I have friends who are like, man, I'll never start a company with my, with my spouse, right? I, I, you know, I can't do it right. How did you <laughs> walk through those dynamics, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, and, and you being someone in HR, I think, I think you'll appreciate this. Um, so we actually, we worked together uh, at our old company uh, for, for five years. Well, we worked together for six years and we were uh, a couple for five years. And during that whole five years, no one in the company knew we were dating. 
It was we actually we got married. I, I flew to India and we got a, a wedding in India, and flew back and, and no one knew. Um, and so and so we can and so we just get like got used to being different people at work. Uh, that makes sense. Like, you know, at work we would just you know we we put on this we kind of slip in this different different personality of like well this is work Reese and work Natasha, and we get home and it's like well this is this is home Reese home Natasha. Um, and I think a little bit of that, of that has just kind of been ingrained in us uh, from doing that for, for several years. And so I think when we're at work, it's, I, I know people might think we don't like each other if they see the work because we're not, we're not like, you know, uh, maybe not, we're not like lovey-dovey and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I guess, I guess maybe that's the thing that's worked for us is, is just, you know, really delineating, you know, where, where you're a couple and where you're not. Do, do your employees know? I'm guessing your employees know that you're married. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. Do yeah. they ever try to like, play you off against each other, like you know, mommy <laughs> against daddy? Uh, uh, not yet. Not that I'm aware of. Maybe they, maybe, and we, if we did, maybe we fell for it. But uh, um, yeah, that, that hasn't come up yet. Knock on wood. Hey, Reese, I understand you have something for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. So we have a um. We are doing a promotion on our scooter right now, a limited time promotion, uh, where we're doing 20% off. Normally our scooters are $700, uh, but now we're selling them for $550. Uh, and we only have a limited quantity of these. So uh, if you go on our website, uh, www.som-ev.com, uh, you should be able to follow the links there to our scooter promotion. And Reese, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yes. Um, so if you want to find us on uh, Instagram, oh, geez, I just pulled up here to make sure I don't, I don't mess it up here. Okay. Oh, geez. Here it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. Um, okay. So we are on, uh, like I said, our website is uh, SOM dash ev.com our instagram is going to be somerville underscore ev and our facebook is uh somerville dot ev and our twitter is somerville underscore ev and for a list of we have the link to his to his uh, offer and the social media on the show notes you can find the show notes at www.kevinshlblog.com so reese back to the moped how, what's the, like the life cycle of a moped is like five years, seven years, or is it strictly this tied to the battery? Yeah. You know, it, it's, well, if you do, if you're doing an electric moped, um, it is definitely tied to the battery. Um, but you know, mechanically, uh, and, and, and that's another thing too, is, is strictly speaking about electric mopeds. Um, something that, that you learn to appreciate if you worked on, you know, gasoline, internal combustion engine things, and then move to moped, move to electric things, is how much uh, simpler and cleaner and more reliable and more robust electric drivetrains are, electric motors are. Because uh, I mean, these things will last forever. Like if if you're not doing anything like really crazy, um, I mean, you, you, like your moped, you're gonna replace replace some tires maybe every year or so, um, maybe some bearings every five, six years. But other than that, I mean, you, you should be able to ride this thing to the ground, honestly. So Reese, speaking of doing something crazy, I'm guessing it's not too smart to take your moped off-roading, is it? <laughs> uh, you know, some people might disagree with me, but uh, I would say, I would say keep it on the road. But, you know, if you're right off-road, knock yourself out. I mean, there's, they, they do make, um, actually, a, a a kind of a big industry in electric bikes is electric uh, off-road bicycles. That's kind of a big deal um, because I mean, that's, that's like, you know, real, some torque where you need it, you know? So Reese, have all your customers come from like water mouth or organic? I'm guessing you know, you're not really doing like paid advertising or nothing yet, are you? Uh, we do a little bit of that, but you know, it's again, especially because we're, we're local right now, we're, we're selling to the greater Boston area, the New England area. Um, we've been a, a bit word of mouth. We've been, um, you know, people have like heard about us through, uh, like articles we've been in or, um, places we've been featured. Um, 
There's been a little paid advertising, but not not a lot. So Reese, we can never end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Oh man. Um I would say I would say um uh, you know I would say your your electric vehicle, if you want an electric vehicle, if you want to go electric, uh, Tesla is not the only game in town. Um, that there, yeah, I think you'd be surprised at how much you can get done uh, with a vehicle that does not have four wheels. Thank you, Reese. Thank you for your time, Dave. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me. This, is, this has been wonderful. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.